lavish lifestyle that you led. How did you fund that? Why do you think you weren't caught? You're dealing with severely paranoid people. And I became one of those people as well. I became extremely paranoid. I got really lucky at the period of time in the world when I became a criminal. And here's why. Right. And we're back on. So all these trips that you've um, taken across the world and all the sort of lavish lifestyle that you led, how did you fund that? So, I mean, the majority of the money that I made was really put into traveling. So like one thing that I've talked about within uh, some other podcasts is, and the book as well is that for me, I was never the guy that like bought things. You know what I mean? I purchased experiences with everything that I profited. So a big thing for me was traveling. Obviously, I had to sometimes because of uh, the stuff that I was doing and meeting contacts and stuff. But the majority of it, it just became a lifestyle where I was just I, I couldn't stay in my city for longer than like a month without leaving somewhere. So um, when it came, comes to like what I was actually doing uh, for money, I mean, that's explained in other podcasts in the book, but the real breakdown is I had a few different rackets. Some were really profitable. Some were just a couple extra bucks that I would make uh, throughout the year. Um, the big one for me uh, that came in, I'd say a year or two after the debt collections and everything like that was the embezzlement. And I had a couple of companies where we had, you know, uh, chief financial officers or accountants or whoever inside of these companies and they would either um, set up like uh, payable accounts or you know shell companies like insurance companies and stuff like that that one was probably my most profitable over the years I think you know at its low point it was probably doing 150 200 thousand a year Canadian um, so that was the that was the lion's share that was the majority um, I would still do a little bit of debt collections that would bring me like whatever, another 50,000 a year or something. Um, I did, um, I guess you call it identity theft, which is we had people that worked inside the banks that would get us uh, contact information. So it could be everything from um, credit card information to actual banking information. Um, we had other guys that had passports, IDs. We had people that worked in nightclubs that would give us, you know, IDs and passports that people left behind to use for, you know, whatever we were using it for, which was, you know, fraud and, and identity theft, right? Um, trying to think here, what else? Um, obviously, the money laundering, which is like uh, one of the bigger topics. And that was something, again, that could bring me around 100000 200000 a year. And the way that worked, I'll break it down really quickly. Um, it's not as complex as a lot of people would think, but it was basically, you know, we had companies in Panama specifically, real estate companies and some other legitimate companies that have been around for 20, 30 years that had good relationships with banks. And what we would do is if I had somebody here in Canada that wanted to move some money, uh, we charge them a fee. Depends on the amount, depends on the person, but it usually be around 25% of whatever they were moving. And it wouldn't be anything less than like, let's say a quarter million. It was usually around quarter million, half a million, sometimes a million dollars. So what this person would do, let's say it's a drug dealer or whatever, they bring the money uh, to me or my contact in Ontario and they would pay in cash. So there was no actual transfers. There was no digital footprint. So if someone's moving a quarter million dollars, they need to get a quarter million in cash or sometimes people would do gold or watches or whatever, but most of the time it was it was cash. Uh, bring it to Ontario. Now the person in Ontario is a legitimate, he's, he's doing some crooked stuff, but he's a legitimate businessman that has legitimate companies that can transfer uh, without discrimination. So for instance, you bring half a million or let's say let's say four hundred thousand, just to make it a nice even number. Four hundred thousand, you're getting that guy's getting taxed twenty five percent, so that's a hundred thousand he loses on that right away. I'm gonna take probably half of that or a little bit less, so I'll take thirty or forty grand off of that, um, and the rest will go to the businessman. The businessman will send that money to one of our companies in Panama, either one of the shell companies or one of the legitimate companies or to a bank account or whatever. And depending on the person and what they want to do with that money, the, the cash may be available to them on the other end. 
so they could take it out in cash in Panama. They could invest it into legitimate real estate, um, or they could. There, there, there's a whole bunch of things. Again, it depends on the person and what they want to do. Some people want to have that cash available and just have it cleaned. Others actually want to just put it into a clean investment. And that once it gets to Panama, that's a lot easier because we had contacts in other countries as well, in South America and in the Caribbean and stuff. So maybe they want to buy a, a condo in the Dominican Republic, but they need the money cleaned up. So it's going to go through Panama first. Now, most of the time that I did this, it was three or four times a year. And I told you the amounts. So, you know, I I take like 20, 30 grand, depending on how much it was, 50 grand, whatever. I do that three or four times a year. It was not something I did every week. Um, it was just extra money. And it was only with guys that I trusted and guys that had like good relationships with people. And um, yeah, outside of that. So the embezzling, the money laundering, which went on for about four or five years, um, the identity theft. Um, and then I had my own side thing where I would help people get permanent residency in certain countries. And that was more legitimate. So sometimes it was for a guy that was moving illegally, but it would be like um, they don't have contacts in Panama, but they want a second permanent residence and they want to start up a business or whatever. I would actually go down there and meet with lawyer, meet with immigration, do that kind of stuff. I did that a couple of times a year. I didn't take a lot off of it. I might make 10,000 here, 5,000 here, whatever. All Obviously, all of my expenses were taken care of, but for the most part, it was just um, helping people out. So I did a lot of stuff like that, but the real line share, the one that got me up to making like, you know, four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars a year, it, it was definitely the embezzlement and the money laundering. Well, wow. yeah. So you had um, your fingers in a number of pies then. Yeah, yeah, and 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 to be honest, I wasn't a hundred percent into everything. Like none of this stuff was full time. So you ran it as like a, a a business. So you had a company. You had a. SFA, uh, financial service guy, I don't know the title, but you had someone running your finances, you had directors and things like that. So you had a proper company. Yeah, well, there was a bunch of different shell companies used. Like for me, what I was really good at was finding legitimate people that would do illegitimate things for a cut. You know what I mean? And some people, you got to understand in that life, uh, in the criminal world, there's a lot of legitimate people that just like to be around gangsters or criminal activity and whatever else. So there was a lot of times where a simple conversation had to be had, and then you could get away with a lot. Like we had guys, I, I can think of one guy that I met in Panama that, you know, I went and had coffee with him and, you know, a couple of weeks later we were using his company to move, to move some funds around. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, once you're in it and once you're connected to certain people and once you have a little bit of a history and a resume, the doors open up for you. You know what I mean? Because to a lot of people, what I was doing sounds really complicated and it sounds like, oh, you have to be super connected for this and stuff. But like a lot of it really does come down to your character and the way that people see you, especially in the criminal world, because um, by the time I had met people in Panama, I had already, you know, I'd already basically been shooting in with this organized crime group i've already done debt collections i've already done some scams so it's like i've already kind of built my resume up a little bit and these people feel comfortable now here's the thing you're dealing with severely paranoid people and i became one of those people as well i became extremely paranoid um my closest friends my brothers the people that i spent every day with in my country and in my city i never involved in anything that i did one of the reasons was because I didn't trust them, which is crazy because these are my brothers. But the reality is there's certain levels to this and some people can't come with you for the whole ride. The other part of it was that I never wanted to take the people that I was with and give them bad consequences in life. So even though I took very good care of all the people around me, trips, mortgages, I help people with cancer treatment, I help people with all kinds of stuff with my money over the years, I never involved my friends in the activities that I was doing because I made my choice and I was aware of the consequences and I still am today even talking about it. But what I wouldn't do is bring family or a friend into it because a lot of people don't have self-control either. One thing that I've really tried to stress to people is I could have made 
so much more money. I had to learn not to be greedy, even though it sounds like I was, I could have been a drug dealer. I had contacts in the US, Mexico, Colombia, Italy, England. I could have made millions of dollars a year. I could have accepted every single proposition that came to me for money laundering. I would have made millions. You know what I mean? I kept it at at a level where I was, you know, in my mind I was rich, but I was also um still in control. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. You say your friends and family, they can't con control their kind of greed. Yeah. But also, they might not be able to control their mouths. That as well. Yeah. You know, today, like, let's say tomorrow, you know, I get indicted and, th and they come after me and, and they pull a bunch of people in. Most of the people that know anything about my story learned about it from the podcast. Even my best friends, like, like I said, my best friends, guys that I love, that are like family to me. Um, because in many ways, my, my friends were more of my family than my actual family was. But even those guys, if you brought them in today, if a, if a federal agent brought them in or a police officer or whatever, and asked them for information, like delicate, detailed information, they don't have it. They learned how everybody else learned. They might know that, you know, a few years ago, I let one of my friends know that I have a safety deposit box in Pan Panama. You know what I mean? I might have let somebody else know that. I, you know, I was embezzling from a company, you know what I mean? But I never, ever shared intimate details. And that's why I was able to do it as long as I did. Because you're right. People do talk, you know what I mean? And you can't risk that, you know what I mean? Because as much as you love someone, if they get in a tight jam, I got friends that are drug dealers. If they, if they get caught and they're caught with five, 10 grand worth of crap or whatever, and they're facing five years, maybe they'll point at me and they'll say, you know what? I got someone bigger. I want to go after this guy that's involved in the mm. organized crime and moving all this money around the world. And then the feds are like, hell yeah, we do. So yeah, I, I was good to keep my mouth shut like that. Yeah. You hear about it. <clears throat> you hear about it in this genre as well. Don't you? The, the mob tube genre where you, uh, people kind of, um, go to prison potentially for a long time. And then there's a bigger fish out there. And then if they tell on the bigger fish, then they get a few years in prison or nothing. And then the, the bigger fish goes to prison for the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, they're, they're free. Well, and you know what? Like one thing I've always said to my friends and they, they don't really understand this, but I got really lucky at the period of time in the world when I became a criminal. And here's why, because I had so much time to learn before I became a criminal. So all this stuff that you see, this, this mob tube culture, and uh social media and stuff like that i was learning for years you know what i mean i'm 35 years old i got into what i was doing when i was around 27 i still had years of watching all the stories play out so even though you know a part of me when i was younger a teenager or whatever i wanted to be a gangster you know i wanted to be a a mafioso or whatever but then you know i'm starting to watch movies and then i start watching documentaries and then i see guys start talking on on youtube and stuff and i start to realize okay it's not as pretty as it looks there's a lot of people ratting there's a lot of people going against each other your own friend can kill you i'm learning all this stuff before i even get into it so i already had a template of what not to do that doesn't mean that i did everything perfectly because obviously nobody does but it really gave me a real lesson on like, don't trust people, like do this on your own. And that's why I was like a lone wolf. I was connected in a lot of places. I had friends over here. I had friends over there. I could get whatever I needed. But at the same time, I always kept everything a little bit at a distance just to be cautious. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you weren't caught? Just because of you, you kept it kind of close to your chest and there was um, no paper trail. Are they the two main factors? Or are there it's others? definitely a big one. So like, again, if the feds come tomorrow, they, they arrest me on accusations or whatever, it's, they're going to have a really hard time. It's not impossible because they have a lot of resources and they have a lot of, you know, very smart people within that system. But because like I've never, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on camera right now, but I've never had a transaction between Canada and one of these countries. So if I was doing something in Cardiff, if I was doing something in Milan, 
I was doing something in Panama City. There is no digital trace to my name for any of that. I dealt with a lot of cash and I dealt with a lot of, if, if I couldn't get cash, like, hey, just, just to explain this to people, if I went to Panama and I needed to pick up $50,000 that was owed to me, I would have another company, one of these legitimate companies, pull the cash for me. Now, that may take a little bit of time because you don't want it to look whatever. Might be 5000 here, 10000 here. I'll spend a couple of weeks out there. But by the end of it, I have my cash. Now, I also have people inside of those countries that can transfer money to either to me or to my friends or whatever else. Like there's, there's so many layers that I put up. So yeah, definitely that's one of them. Um, doing everything on your own, not being part of an organization is actually really fruitful as well because I still have the contacts. I still have my connections. I'm still friends with some of these guys, but they don't know enough about me. Some of them didn't even know my real name. I had another identity, right? So there's so many layers that if something does fuck up, it doesn't mean that it's impossible for me to get caught. But the reality is for seven to eight years, I was doing everything that I've spoken about. I didn't get charged once. The closest calls that I ever had was really with immigration because I was flying too much. And there's a lot of people that don't believe like, you know, some of the things that I'm saying, but if you ever had a doubt in how much I traveled or, or where I went, those things are easy to pull up. You know what I mean? And that, that was the only time there was one time in England, actually at Gatwick that I thought that I was going to get, uh, that something was going on. And it was basically where, you know, I talked about the identity theft and how we used USB sticks and I would sell them off to Albanian or Nigerian groups within England. And there was one time that I was going over there and I was just stopping there before I went to Italy, but I was dropping off a couple of these USB sticks and I got pulled aside from, uh, what do you guys call it? Border patrol. Yeah. Yeah. Customs. yeah I think, yeah. Customs. Yeah. So I got pulled aside and they actually grabbed my suitcase and they, and they went through it. Now I'd been pulled aside and had my, co uh, passport confiscated a few times in England. Uh, and other countries as well, but I never had anything on me the time that I got pulled. So I was so paranoid at this time. Like I said, the paranoia existed within me too. I I was so worried that that day that somebody had said something about the USB sticks and, you know, sure enough, we go through the bag. They're going through all my stuff. The guy lists the USB stick. You know, there's a couple of them. He says, what's this? I was like, oh, that's just for work. He's like, oh, okay, what do you do? And I tell him I'm in sales or whatever else. And um, and he puts it back and he packs my things and I, and I left. And I swear to God, that was probably the only time in England that I was like, oh my God. Like if they, you know, obviously it they wouldn't just like pop in a USB stick to see what's what's on it, right? But if somebody told them, you know, this guy's doing this, then maybe they would have grounds to or rights to. So in my mind, I'm like, man, this it could hit the fan right now and I'm arrested in a Gatwick airport. You know what I mean? So, um, but other than that, like dealing with that kind of stuff is the only, uh, the only real issue I ever had in seven or eight years, man, you know? And then obviously the end, how everything ended. Then, then I started to deal with some other problems, but yeah. I was going to say, actually, I wasn't going to ask you about that, but I was just going to mention that if anyone is interested in the uh, ending, which is fascinating, yeah, go and go and buy his book. I'll put a link in the description. Thank box. you, thank you. For that. There's 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 so many stories that we haven't covered, and if we did, we'd probably be I don't know, twenty four hours on the podcast, if not longer. <laughs> yeah, well, and even the book itself, and you you know this, I think the book is relatively small and short, so. Mm -hmm. The way that I set everything up from the beginning, the minute that I decided I'm going to talk and write a book, do podcasts, and then eventually a documentary, I always give like crumbs or pieces of the pie in each thing that I do, but I never give it completely because I wanted to do this for a year or two, right? So there's even stuff I'd say the book is a real good base. It, it, it covers a lot of base of things, but real detailed stories are stuff that I'm saving for, you know, uh, moments like this, like on podcast or obviously with the documentary as well. <clears throat> right. You mentioned paranoia played a big part of your life when you were involved in the uh, 
the traveling and the high lifestyle. So does, does paranoia play any part of your ro role in your life now? Um, yeah, but it's on, it's on a real human level. It's not so much a criminal level anymore. It's just like, um, just becoming more aware of people and their intentions. And, you know, I've always been a bit of an empath. I think that uh, one thing about Italians, Italian blooded people, is that we know human nature very well. And I think that I was, you know, in that seven or eight year period, I was on just such a high and just enjoying life so much that I let a lot of things slide that I normally wouldn't. So this could just be like fake friends. It could be um, gossip. Like a lot of the stuff that I was engaging in during those years, I would not touch now. And I think the real reason why that changed so much for me is because when I came back in December 2022 to Canada, um, you know, my whole world had fallen apart. And in my mind, this is where, this is not so much with paranoia, but this is more about expectations, the expectations that we have of other people and being disappointed by having those expectations. So in my mind, when I came back, I had nothing. I expected people to show up for me. You know what I mean? Because there was people I took care of for years in, in some of the ways that I, I discussed earlier, but. Some that, like, you know, I, I put people on higher platforms. I put, you know, I took people all over the world. I paid bills, whatever else. And it's because I love these people. And never in my mind was I keeping score or thinking that these people owed me. But at that time in my life, the first time in like nine, 10 years that I really needed help, people didn't show up for me. You know what I mean? My best friends, my brothers, and people had excuses. And uh, it was addressed, you know, later into last year. Um, I kind of said, you know, you guys didn't show up for me the way that you should have. You know what I mean? Like, I was the boss in, in my group in the sense that, like, I just always had this, like, leadership quality, I guess, to me. But then on top of it, on a financial, on an economical level, I was also the boss because I was the only one making that kind of money and making dreams happen for people. So in my mind, again, with the expectations, I was like, um, you know, I, I expected better from people. Now, going back into paranoia, like I said, on a human level, now I'm just more judgmental about what people's um intentions are. And that even works in this podcast world as well. You know what I mean? I've had people, um, I've only done a couple of podcasts since the big one that I did in November. And um, I've had a lot of options to do other ones, but I, I don't like the way that these guys move. I don't like the way that it's just like, they're really just trying to, uh, get clickbait and, and build up this, this really shitty platform. And I don't like that. Right. So there's a lot of people that, um, yeah, that I'm paranoid to in this world. Cause this is different for me. You got to understand that I've always been on Facebook, but I mean, up until last year and getting Instagram for the first time in my life. I was never on any other social media. So this world is, in my opinion, and you've probably seen it yourself too, is very volatile. You know what I mean? It's entertaining as hell. I love it. You know what I mean? I, I love watching interviews. I love hearing about history and all that kind of stuff. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of people in this genre that are just shitty fucking people. You know what I mean? You've had some experience with that, you know? Um and, and like funny because the person that really set me straight when it came to this whole thing was actually my director. So when I went out to Spain a couple of months ago, I was about to work with a couple of guys that will re remain nameless, but they were guys that are in that world that were organized crime figures. And I was about to do a go do a podcast with a few of these guys and um, they have big platforms and I think it would have worked well for me. But my director said, listen, I can give you some advice. You're different from them. First of all, you're not a violent, crazy gangster. Second of all, and more importantly, you're not an informant. You know, most of these guys that are talking now are informants. And the minute that me as a guest, not as a podcaster, but as a guest, the minute that you go onto a platform with guys that have done that, you get bunched in with them. You know what I mean? Like you become like that. And it's like, my story is, is significantly different because 
I was not caught. I did not inform. And I'm much younger than a lot of the guys that are on these podcasts, right? Most of these guys are in their 40s, 50s, maybe even 60s. So it's like, I have to be very careful. And I'm still learning. I have to be very careful about um, who I choose to work with. And to be honest, I'll be 100% with you. Once this documentary drops, obviously, I think that I'll have a lot of opportunities and some interviews and who knows what could happen. But I'm really giving it a short lifespan because I want to just kind of do this, this project and be done with it and then move on with my life. You know what I mean? So um, I know that's a long <laughs> explanation based off the, the question that you asked about the paranoia. But my paranoia these days is, like I said, more on a human level towards the company that I keep, uh, what their intentions are, and then also the people that I work with in this genre. Yeah, that's that's a fascinating um, sort of observation, psychological observation. Yeah, really interesting. Mm -hmm. Can we, before we talk about your um, documentary, can I um, just pull out a few quotes from your book? And uh, that would be great. Right, so I've got three. Okay, the first one is, writing this book has given me new confidence and strength, both in my life and in myself. And I will no longer compromise or tolerate when it comes to aimless, disrespectful, one-sided or toxic relationships. And if that means I have to be alone for a while, then so be it. Yeah, wow. So that that actually ties in with what we were just talking about too. So, um, mm. you know, over that those seven or eight years, listen, love dominates my life. And we're going to get into that later, I'm, I'm sure as well. But it's the one thing that's been missing for me throughout many years. You know, I spent so much time in group homes. I had abandonment issues with my mom. Uh, I was outcasted as a black sheep from my family, um, even before criminal activity. And, you know, all these relationships, these friendships and, and love relationships that I had. And through those seven or eight years, I really, like I said, allowed a lot of crappy people around me. And it was because I love them. You know what I mean? It's because whether it was a woman in my life, like a toxic ex-girlfriend, or whether it was like one of my best friends that just did not share the same morals or values that I did in life because of my love for them. I just allowed them to stay around. And I guess because my life was very liberated and free in many ways, I could deal with it. But then once I came back to, you know, civilization and once I started uh, being like everybody else and working a job and my time is not as free and, and, you know, money's not as free and whatever else, I have a lot more stress in my life. I, I couldn't deal with that anymore. And I started really looking around the people and it wasn't just people that didn't show up for me. It was just like, you know, I had a lot of this last year and a half has been really hard because on top of me leaving the life and going from rich to broke and traveling every month to, to foreign places to, you know, being stuck in one place on top of that, I had to, I was forced to really sit with the company that I kept. And I realized, like, man, I, I have nothing in common with these guys. A lot of these guys are on drugs or selling drugs. They're getting drunk five days a week like they're still kids. They're cheating on their woman. They're just, they're not good people. And that's not what I want around me. And I think I was so desperate to have community, you know, just like everybody else is as, as, as a man, as a human, human being, that I just allowed these people to stay with me and now I won't. So I have spent a lot of the last year and a half a lot uh lonelier than i was and even more so in the last couple of months i basically cut off everybody in, except for a couple of good people that i have with me um and i've just become completely focused on me my projects and nothing else and and to be honest i'm way more happier like that too you know, i was about to ask you out the from twitter and so so second question while money offers freedom and luxuries, it really doesn't provide happiness. Yeah. So, you know, this is this is loaded, but the the short version of it is that once you're in the life, and let's not even say the criminal life, let's just talk about money. There's certain levels, plateaus, peaks that you that you hit, and then they burn out. So if you're a guy that's never made any money and you go up to making a hundred thousand dollars a year, that's very exciting in the beginning. And it, it offers you liberties. 
and it offers you can go on vacation now a couple times a year. All your bills are paid. You can go eat where you want, whatever. And then like as the amount increases, so does the the liberties and the freedom and the gifts or whatever else. But um, it gets to a certain point where unless you keep elevating, you're and if you're focused solely on like um you know, the, the stimulation that you're getting from money, it goes away very quickly. And it went away for me too. Like obviously the first year or two that I had this money, it was wild. And it was something, it was like a dream, living a dream. But it really, if you compared it to like the love of a woman, being around your family, being around your friends, there is no comparison to me. Now that's not for everybody. There's other people that would rather just have a bunch of money and be miserable and all their other aspects of life. I, I had to learn like through that, that money doesn't buy happiness. It does buy liberties. It does buy freedom. It can do nice things for you, but it really isn't, it shouldn't be an indicator on your level of happiness. And a lot of us do do that. And I did that myself too. You know, I used to dream before um, I made any money in the criminal world, I dreamed of having just $5,000 in my bank account because I was so poor my whole life. I thought that if I had that in my account, like my life is good and everything is fine. That's how dumb I was. But a lot of us think like that, you know, people think of it on a different level, but I know guys that are like, Oh, I just want a hundred thousand dollars. I want a million dollars. And I'm like, okay. And then what, you know what I mean? What happens after that? And, and if you don't start really toning in on what's important to you and you make it all about money, you're gonna be very miserable because the whole point of the whole concept of money is to be in your hand and to be out your hand and in your hand and out your hand. It's not meant to stay. So if you're in a position where you're like, okay, I'm happy when I have money, but I'm not happy when I don't, you're fucked and you're in for a really long ride. It's a societal thing though, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like when, when you speak to someone um, or you hear somebody ask or or point the finger and say like you know you're successful what does that mean it means the vast majority of people think it means oh you've got a good job loads of money in the yeah. bank but to me that's not success i mean that that could contribute towards mm -hmm. success but that's not the be all in end i don't think someone's successful if they got shit loads of money yeah. and yet they're mis like you say they're miserable as saying i wouldn't say that's a su not at successful all. life not at all. And and really happiness, and, and you tie that in with success, obviously, because you know, a lot of people think that you have to be successful to be happy. And in some ways, that's true. But depending on what that success is, um, I think that, where was I going with this? I think that um, there's a lot of people I know here that are successful, like in societal, like in society's view. So they've got a nice car. They've got the house, they got the family, they got everything that we're supposed to have in society, but they're miserable. In fact, when I got um when I got exposure to real money, like people that are millionaires or ten times over, um, I really realized that some of the people that I knew back here in Winnipeg that have like, you know, I don't want to say shitty lives, but like they're just not they're they're just they're just Simple surviving. Lives. They're just getting by, you know? They're 10 times happier yeah. than those people that I knew over there with money. You know what I mean? I, I, and I had to learn that the hard way. Like, that's what, that's also another, this is just kind of drifting off a bit, but like, that's one reason why people have asked me, why didn't I join this family like that I was connected with? Um, and it, And that's why. Because I knew like, if I stepped in with them, I could make more money than I've ever made in my life. And I, I could live a crazy crazy life way vast beyond what i've seen but i saw how miserable all of them were and, and that that's a whole another life that comes yeah. with different stresses and paranoias and stuff but i was like there's no way you know what i mean so yeah it's uh you know what the best thing to do is is not go by what society tells you works because society is part of a structure and a system and it has flaws and it has cracks and it was also built by someone else much more intelligent than you and I, right? So if we're following this blueprint that somebody gave to us, there's probably a reason why they gave it to us. You know what I mean? Yeah, because they could reach it and perhaps we can. Yeah, or, or you know, 
they're also setting limits on us as well. You know, I say they, like it's some yeah, conspiracy, but you know what I mean? Like, it's like, if you live in this box, if you, if you have your nine to five and you, uh, you know, you get the house and you get the family and you get the car and you got barbecues on Sunday or whatever, you're happy. But, and some people are okay with that. Some people are fine with that. And to be honest, I am, you know what I mean? One thing I will say is that a lot of what people have, uh, today, like even some of my family and friends around me, I would be so happy if I had that, honestly. And it's not good to compare yourself like that. But like, I always tell them like, you have, you're so much richer than I am. You know what I mean? Because I had friends that, you know, stupid young guys in their late 20s and they see me traveling and all this shit. And they're just like, man, you're living the dream. I'm like, okay, you live at home. You have both of your parents. You're in a beautiful relationship with your girlfriend for three or three or four years. You, you have a company that you've established. Like you're doing a lot of things, man. Like don't, don't forget what you have because to someone else that might look shiny. And for me, it was. I always wanted that life, by the way. I always wanted a normal life. Like, I wish that I had gone to school all the way up until, you know, grade 12, graduated, gotten a degree, had the cookie cutter stuff because I never had that. Maybe I did have that opportunity. I can't tell you when, though. Like, for me, this has always been kind of what it was. That's why when I was 27 that I went to crime because I was like, I'm not, I'm not existing very well in this normal world here. Like, I don't know how to manage it. I don't know how to, you know, to, to, to cut through it. So let me go try this over here because I'm tired of being hungry. I'm tired of being broke. I'm tired of not being able to do things. But with that process and going through that life, all it's done is taking me backwards. And I, I have to start now at 35 years old where other people started maybe when they're 20 or when they're 16 or whatever. So be, people don't realize that there's a consequence, a natural order consequence to what I've done as well. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people think you can get arrested, you can get killed, you can lose everything, but they don't talk about this simple stuff like this, where it's like, man, I got to learn how to be a fucking civilian again. You know what I mean? At 35 years old, I've even gone to jail. It's 10 times tougher for those guys. You know what I mean? But yeah, don't let me go off too much on that because that's a whole another podcast. That's another hour and a half. <laughs> Good. This is grass is greener syndrome. It isn't is, it? and we all have it. Doesn't matter what what mm. area you are in life. No, exactly. The last one of your quotes I was going to bring up, and I think you kind of answered that already. But if you do want to add a few bits, that's fine. If there was ever a single four letter word that completely dominated my life, it would be love. Yeah. Love. Yeah. So yeah, we, we basically touched on it, but what I will say is, uh, for me, there's no greater purpose in life. You know, people have religion, people have money, people have businesses, they have their zests, their reasons for me, it's love. Like there's never been even in, uh, with my wife, even though that was short lived, that was the first time that I really had it all. You know what I mean? I had money. I had my way out. I was leaving the, you know, the, the the criminal life or whatever she had a daughter so you get that familial kind of vibe right it's like us as a family um that love is something that i've chased my whole life and not just with women but like family and friends and stuff like that and to me even today there's nothing better worth working for it's the reason why men fathers uh husbands will get up every day at six o'clock in the morning, five 30 in the morning or whatever, go to work, slave away, get their asses kicked, come home, play with their children, you know, talk to their wife, make love, do everything that exhausts them because that, that little level of, of happiness and fullness in life, there's nothing more addicting or satisfying in my opinion. Yeah. I get you. You're a deep guy, not you, Jim. Yeah, and that's why, like, I don't belong in the world that I was in, mm -hmm. right? Like, I'm very, I'm an intellectual. A lot of these guys, no offense to them, but they're, you know what I mean? They're like cavemen, and they and they got rid of their emotions a long time ago because some of them had to be violent, some of them had to be liars or conniving or whatever. But for me, I mean, this is who I am. Like, you, you, you get that side of me, that that part of my life. But I mean, who I am talking to you today is who I really am. And like you said, I'm, I'm a deep guy.
<laughs> you're a deep yeah. guy. Um, your love interest is another uh, fascinating part yeah. of it. Um, but let, let's go on to uh, life nowadays, but, um, if that's sure. all right with you. Yep. So your, your relationship with your friends and family nowadays, how's that going? Any improvements? Yeah, so um, recently, just before I went to Spain a couple of months ago, I reconnected with my oldest sister for the first time in probably two and a half years or so. And uh, I've actually been staying with her since I got back from Spain um and it's been great to be around her and my nieces like you know we're talking about the family stuff um i haven't had that for a very long time um earlier on it was just because of uh my family's history and the toxicity and the gossip and all that stuff i left that a long time ago when my mom passed away which was over 10 years ago but when i got into um doing crime I, I distanced myself even further because I didn't want to bring them into that. And and because that whole lone wolf aspect, I, I you know, with friends, I could keep them close, but with family, I couldn't because like, I, I don't want to live a double life. I don't want to lie to you. I'm very honest. Like if you sit and have a conversation with me and ask me a question, I'll tell you the truth. And, th and that has consequences. A lot of people like to lie and stuff, but I don't want to sit with, uh, you know, an auntie and she asked me how I'm doing and I got to make up lies like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this, that and that. I'll lie to immigration. I'll lie to, you know, whoever I have to to cross a border. But like, I'm, I don't want to sit there with people that I love and care about and have to either be judged for what I'm doing or have to lie about it. Right. So uh, on the family aspect, I mean, that's definitely improved on the friendship aspect. Uh, it's been a year and a half process, but I'd say that what started a year ago a year and a half ago when I first came back has kind of came full circle. And all I mean by that is like, I've, I've cut ties with all the people that even up in to like two months ago, I was spending all my days with and even living with, um, I've cut all of that out of my life. I don't really want friends right now. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I want friends, but like, I don't want people that I'm with every day anymore right now. I just can't handle that. Um, I'm too focused on what I got to do. And I'm also just like, I don't have the, uh, I'm an emotional guy and I'm very empathetic. So like if I spend time with you days at a time, like I'm, I'm invested in you emotionally. So, I mean, if you got shit going on in your life and it's toxic or negative, or I don't agree with it, it's very hard for me to be quiet about it, but I, I don't want to talk about it anymore either. So I'm like, it's better to just like stay away and give people their space and let them do their thing. And for now, I'm like I said, going to work on me, my relationship with my my sister, my nieces, a couple of friends that I've kept close to me, uh, staying in contact with my director, who's become like kind of like a, a mentor to me s since meeting him as well. Um, and that's kind of it for me. That's good, man. It sounds like um, you've got three or four special relationships like forming or and that's all you need. So that, that's, that's all that's you good. need. Yeah. 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 Keep them mm -hmm. close. So what are you doing for money nowadays? So when I first came back, uh, it's, it's, I laugh talking about this, but when I first came back, uh, I had to go work a job for the first time in like nine, 10 years. You know, I hadn't worked a job in nine or 10 years, which is wild. Um, I worked at a club. I was just doing part time. I was making decent money. I did that up until about October of last year. And then because of what I wanted to do with the book, I quit. Because I couldn't get the time off. Like I needed to go to um to to New York uh to promote the book. I needed to go to LA to do a podcast. I needed to do some other things and I wasn't getting that time off of work. So I saved up a little bit of money, not much, a few a few grand. And then I released the book in my city and I sold some copies, made a couple extra grand, and that kind of funded me towards doing what I was doing. But I also noticed instantly that I went into debt. Uh, I'd say probably like October, November of last year, because I got all these opportunities all of a sudden, and I didn't have the money to fund them. You know what I mean? Like when I went to New York, I want to, cause I knew you had some interest in talking about this, about how, how I did what I did or whatever. But when I went to New York, basically like I paid for a space in Times Square and for anyone that wants to do this, I'm, I'm putting them on a real a real hookup here right now. Um, I forget the website, but if you just type in like time, uh, Times Square billboard advertising in Google, 
there'll be this um, one company that shows up and they basically give you a, a breakdown of the pricing of, of all the billboards. And there was this one in particular. So this is the one you guys are going to look for if you want to promote anything. Um, there's this one in particular above the I Love New York store. Um, and it, it's got a great screen on it. You get it for 24 hours and you pay about a thousand dollars USD. So it's not cheap, but it's also not expensive compared to what a lot of other people charge. So if you want it just to say you had it in Times Square, it's a great place. I believe it plays like four or five times an hour for 24 hours. And then there's also the big one, which people are doing now. This this is amazing that uh, they made this available, but there's this big one in Times Square where you can basically pay, uh, I think, 35 USD, $35 USD, and it just plays once for like 20, 30 seconds, but it's on this massive screen. It's I think it's called the TSX screen, and you can put on that screen, and you you don't even have to be home when you play it. Uh, or you don't even have to be there when you play it, I mean. So what you do is you you type in, uh, you get the TSX app, and you, you pay for it. You put in whatever you want to put in. It could be a 15-second video or a picture. Um, and you pick the time slot that you want it to play, and it'll be on this massive screen in Times Square. And inside the app, you can actually click on this button that says Live, and it'll show you how it looks and everybody walking around and stuff. Super cool. But... Never knew that. So what are you actually doing there then? You had a store yourself physically and you were selling physical books. Yeah. So, okay. So originally, like I was just going to go straight to Amazon, but I wanted to release like um, almost like an incomplete version of the book within my city to let just people in my city and some friends abroad uh, read the book before. So what you've read is believe it or not, uh, there's actually going to be a more extended version to probably another 30 pages. But the first copy was 30 pages, roughly less than what you've read, right? And that was, like I said, just to get family and friends and people excited about it and to have some things for when I went to podcast and say, you know, this is this is the book or whatever. So I originally released in October in Winnipeg. Um, I got like 600 copies printed. I sold a few hundred and, uh, yeah, I was on the street, man. Like I was like old school, like the way that people used to sell their CDs out the back of their truck and stuff. I would post up downtown. I had this little shitty sign that I made that said, you know, like a little bit of information on the book, how much it costed and stuff like that. And I would stand out there. And when I was doing that, by the way, it was cold, man. Like we're talking October, November, December of my uh, city is like minus 30 sometimes minus 40 and I was out there with books and you know some some days I would only sell like five books or whatever but like I love that I did that so I would already started selling the books I put a billboard in my city uh, at this like this one intersection that's kind of famous here where everybody goes so I put that there for a week sold a few copies went to New York Got it on those two billboards I talked about, the one that's for 24 hours and the, the one that's at, uh, for uh, the one-time uh, thing. Um, I went there on my birthday. I did that a couple of weeks later when I did the podcast. Um, <clears throat> and then I basically planned it so that January 1st, or it was supposed to be January 1st, but some things happened. Into January, I dropped the book on Amazon, right? And then I released it through there. but in my mind, it was still not complete. Like there's still stuff that's being added. I, I I really broke this down into like certain chapters of how I'm doing this whole story. So there's going to be another uh, upgraded edition of the book with a little bit more information, but I'm actually going to drop that after the documentary because it makes sense. The real whole point of the book, like trying to really sell it and maybe make a couple bucks off of it, in my mind, was not going to happen until after the documentary because the reality is I'm, I'm a nobody. You know what I mean? I just got on social media, Instagram. I don't have that kind of exposure. I want to, I want the book to reach masses. I want it to reach all around the world. So in order for that to happen, the documentary in my mind was always that platform for it. So I'm hoping towards the end of the year, going into the next year that, um, <clears throat> 
that uh, the documentary drops, I'm going to do the, like, re-release the book again, extended, uh, and a little bit revised. And I'm also planning to drop another book next year as well. But um, if you've read, you've, uh, you know, just speaking with you, um, you've read the bonus chapters in the book, correct? So do yeah. you remember the Broken Hearts Club? So that's that's the that's yeah, the yeah, last chapter in the book. It's the last thing that you read in the book, and it's these stories about these other people, one from Africa and one from Colombia. Oh yes, I do remember it now. It's it's been a month, I think. Yeah, it's since been a, it's book, been a so minute. Yeah, and it's a lot yeah. of information to absorb. But that's actually my next project. So <clears throat> I've already started working on that, but I'm not going to release it until next year. And it's going to be called the Broken Hearts Club, and it's basically a collection of stories of fascinating real life stories of people that I've met throughout the years. So that could be an ex KGB member. It could be someone that was kidnapped by the Colombian cartel. It could just people that have these really interesting life stories or heartbreak. Uh, most of them are going to be like pretty heartbreaking refugee stories and stuff like that. And the, yeah, that's the next project for me. And that's the reason why I put that. I had some people that bought the book that asked me like, why did you put this at the end here? Like, what does this have to do with the book? I was like, it doesn't. But this is to let you know what the next project is. Because one thing I really tried to do in uh, with the Broken Hearts Club in a Winnipeg story was those two stories that you read, those two people are currently in Winnipeg now, right? So they come from that history. But I wanted to highlight other people from my city that had those kind of fascinating stories. Well, yeah. I was actually going to ask you about whether a book two, and I was going to suggest that you write a book two or a kind of sequel to the book one. Sounds like you've got that and more kind of planned or, or in the works. Um, could you, you, you said you kind of want to avoid YouTube, um, maybe in the not too distant future, but would you consider setting up your own channel and interviewing some of these people that maybe picture in your book if they can obviously speak english yeah so when i first did the podcast back in november i, I actually mentioned that i was going to do that so a podcast is something that i want to do i just put it on the back burner for a while because right when i was about to get into it this opportunity came with the director and the documentary i was not expecting that at that time in my life so my whole focus shifted to the documentary now for me I still do want to do a podcast. Um, I think that certain people do well in that field. I think that there's a lot of people that would feel comfortable speaking on my platform because because um, I've been through some stuff and and I've had experience in in this world now. Um, but I think again that's going to come later. So my my whole plan is a year from now I want to be in South America. So I'm still planning to move to Paraguay. And um, I think that if I do start uh, a channel, it's going to be when I'm in Paraguay and I'm set up out there. So it's it's probably not going to happen for a year, year and a half. Yeah. Wow. No, good on you. I'll be, I'll be really, uh, really interested to, um, to watch it. And I'm sure other people For sure. And I'll have you on there read as well. Read it, watch it. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I've got a very interesting story. No, nah, you might be surprised. <laughs> Certainly not man. as interesting as yours. Oh, we'll see. Um, you talk about your documentary. Well, if I remember correctly, the first time I contacted you and we kind of chatted, you were in Spain. Yeah, <clears throat> I, yeah I think so. Yeah. So, can you do you want to explain a bit about your documentary? What it's about? What the title might be? Yeah. Why? Why you've Why you've done it? Sure. So, excuse me. Um. So the documentary right now, the name that we have for it is Lupo. Um, and the reason why Lupo is because it was a nickname that was given to me from uh, basically the the organized crime group that I was with uh, in Milan. Um, they would just, you know, they would call me El Lupo Solitario, which is the lone wolf. And it was because I was always on my own. You know what I mean? Like I would come back and visit these guys after three months and they'll, they were like, you know, where were you? Where were you this time? You know, I'd be like, oh, I was in, you know, Puerto Rico. I was in Colombia, blah, 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 blah. And these guys, are, they, they just started calling me that, right? So 
um that's that's the whole point of the name um the documentary is going to be like you know obviously based on my life and the book but it's way more detail it's way more detail than even i've gone into on these podcasts i really break down everything we did probably i can't even count like just for my interview parts we probably did dozens of hours of of uh like interview segments right and that's probably only going to be um you know half of the documentary so one thing that's really cool that we're doing and this is actually really the first time that i've been able to say this so you're getting some uh some juicy stuff here um obviously there's the documentary format and the um interview format like me speaking to you know the camera or whatever but we're also doing interviews with other people that were involved in my life so one of them is going to be my sister my older sister and is just kind of give it that that you know the family background or profile of me one of them is my best friends um another one is a criminal profiler from interpol uh, and this guy's going to be, this guy's amazing. He's written books and everything. He's from Spain. Uh, he's going to give like really two aspects, uh, two really great aspects on this. So one is going to be to say whether I'm bullshit or not, you know, which is important because there's still a lot of people that have their doubts, which I completely understand, especially with my vagueness and not being so detailed, especially in these interviews. I get it, but he's really going to break down. Okay. Is this possible? Is this really what's going on here, there, there, and there with his information, his experience? And then there's going to be like a more of a psychological profile as well, where it's like why I ended up doing what I did, why I became the guy I was, The you know what I mean? Like how does an empathetic person get into the criminal life and how do they navigate it and that kind of stuff. Um, and then this is really uh for anybody that actually that, that watches this and goes on to watch the documentary this is really um the the i guess the juiciest part i will say one of the interviews that we're doing is with one of the calabrians that i used to work with so um my director is actually going to have to go to italy and meet this guy and it's going to be very cloak and daggers um it's being set up it's not done yet it's going to take some time uh, because obviously the guy is very paranoid and very cautious about, you know, um, you know, revealing himself or even revealing where he is and stuff. So it's going to take some time, but it's going to be really, um, obviously it's going to be a credit to my story, but it's going to be a very cool aspect to the documentary as well, because I mean, you're not going to see this guy's face. I'll say that right now. We're probably going to do something where it's like, you know, film behind him somewhere in like a, like a, you know, a piazza setting or something like that, it's like a little town square. And uh, he's going to basically break down and explain how I came to meet this family, how I got my nickname and a couple of other things that is it's going to be really cool. Um, I was actually against doing this. I'm not going to lie, um, because I really didn't want to involve anyone in the in the documentary. Um, when I even wrote the book, I checked in with people and I made sure that everything was okay the way I was doing things. But I also said, I'm not talking to you guys anymore after this, because the minute that I put my story out there, I get a microscope on me. So I don't want to, I don't want to bring you guys any heat. So I basically just made sure that everybody was cool with what I was doing and the way that I was doing with, with it. And then I cut off communication with a lot of those guys. So for me to even get back into contact with him was a couple month process. Like this is a guy that like basically, you know, he like lives in the mountains. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's on the run, all that kind of stuff for, for several years. So the way that we have to set this up, we have to be very careful and detailed, but it's really going to have a huge impact on the documentary itself. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Where's it dropping? Or done got yeah, we yet. don't have a date, but I think realistically, like early next year, it's going to take a while because like when I went out there, I was just doing like my bits. So like my interview parts, the stolen scenes, all that stuff. But we got to still do the interviews with everybody else. And then we got to do editing and then we got to go to studio. So it's it's a long process, but I, I don't care how long it takes for once in my life. I want to be patient. Let the director do his thing. He's a he's an amazing, phenomenal director. And 
this documentary, like for anyone that saw the teaser, like we came up with that like a week into filming. So like the, he didn't even really have time to put it together, but it still looked amazing. And it let people know, okay, this isn't just a documentary, someone sitting in front of a camera. This is like a movie. And I want to give this guy sufficient amount of time to, to make something beautiful, you know? Totally. Where's the teaser? Where, where can people watch the teaser? Yeah, so it's on my Instagram page. If you go to the Real Germano Tomasetti, um, at the Real Germano Tomasetti, uh, I have it pinned right now as well to my uh, to my profile. So as soon as you go to my profile, it'll be the one in the top left corner, and you can check it out. It's about a two and a half minute teaser. Um, you mentioned the name of your book, but just the name of your book again and um, where people can find it. Yeah, so the book is called The Winnipeg Story, and you can find that on Amazon. Right now, it's uh, there's a paperback edition and then an ebook. I'm going to revise the ebook in the next couple of weeks because I didn't like the way it came out. Um, so I'm going to get that revised. So anybody that's going to you know listen to this, wait a couple of weeks if you if you want to get the ebook just so you can get a better version. And then I, I really want to get the audio book done as well. Uh, and then also within the next month or so, I want to translate in a couple of different languages. So just like Spanish, French, Italian, and, and, and have it available in other languages. Like I said, everything right now is really just setting up for after the documentary. So I want to have everything in place. I want when people watch the doc and they're like, wow, I want to read this book. I want them to be able to go click whatever language it is and, and audio and paperback or whatever and, and just get it. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to see where you are in like 12 months, 24 months. Yeah, definitely. You know, wouldn't it? I bet, I bet you're obviously excited to know what the future holds for you. 100%, man. And like I said, like my whole goal here is like, obviously, I want to get the documentary done and all, and all that kind of stuff. For the rest of this year, though, I'm really, I'm going to do a couple more podcasts. I'm going to keep it just alive, the story alive, so to speak. Uh, do a little bit of promoting. But really, my whole goal is the documentary and, and making my move to, to Paraguay. And then hopefully... Uh, later next year, uh, get into the the podcast game. Look forward to yeah. it. Very last question. Sure. So you're kind of your first entry into, let's say, real crime, should we say, up to now. If you could do it all again, would you? Hmm. That's a tough question. Here's why. The young man in me, the wise man, the wiser man, would say no. Um, because I never wanted to really get into crime. I never wanted to be the bad guy. I never wanted to, you know, to walk that path. But at the same time, I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. So even though I don't feel great about what I did, I don't feel like proud about it. It's not like having a a master's degree or something. It's just, you know, I, I, I did criminal things. I did bad things. I did illegal things. So I'm not really proud of it. Um, but yeah, I'm a firm believer and everything happens for a reason. And, and a lot of those experiences that I had, um, good and bad, made me the man that I am today. And I like who I am today. So I kind of don't want to change anything that's happened to me. And that's that's even the bad things, you know, from the poverty to the crime to the bad breakups and whatever else. It's like this is a part of life. And I honestly feel at 35 years old that I've had 10 lives within one. And, and I'm grateful for that, you know, and it has to come with some mistakes and some shame or whatever else. And, you know, that's, that's it is what it is. Do you know the one thing that popped into my head the other day uh when, when we are as in you me and the vast majority of the people out there yeah sitting with their um grandkids or their nephews you know when, when we're coming on retirement like so what have you done with your life daddy <laughs> yeah <laughs> what have you done with your life you know uncle you'd be like right yeah we need to we need to take this in like 20 parts okay <laughs> yeah, and... <laughs> they'd just be like, "Oh, <laughs> Uncle Germano is like a very good storyteller, very like, uh, you know, like mouths open." But well, what, what the hell was, you know, my kids, uh, nieces and nephews are really. Uh, what have you done with your life then? Uh, well, well, okay. Like, have you got an hour? <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> well, great. Well, 
interesting life, man. Fascinating. One, I think if there is one positive thing I can take out of it, that is that because I, I love stories and I love being a storyteller. And I, I like to think that I, yeah, I've led an interesting life. That doesn't mean it was like always happy. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't always grand, but it's like, it's a real life and it's a story now. And it's immortalized in that sense. You know what I mean? Like I have a book, it'll be a documentary. And to me, if I do nothing else in my life, other than what I've done in the last 10 years, I'm okay with that. I can be normal now. I can, I can do what everybody else does. Maybe I couldn't, maybe I could have before, but I didn't want to. But now I'm like, hey, you know what? Like, even if I have to slave away and I have to have, have, have a very basic life and I don't get to travel anymore or whatever else, I, I'm really happy with what I've done so far. So I'm good. You're good. Yeah. Jimano, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been a real pleasure to chat with you. And um, I wish you all the best in the future, man, really. And I uh, look forward to... Uh, keeping in touch for sure we will and i i appreciate you being so patient um people don't know this that are that are watching this but i've been sick the last couple of weeks so we actually tried to get this done before we had some mishaps and then we're finishing it off now but i really uh i appreciate you being patient with me and we'll yeah we'll definitely speak in the future i mean i consider you like a friend so any anytime you want to hit up i'm sure we'll work together again as well and uh and yeah just keep doing what you're doing because i mean you may not think that you have stories to tell, but I mean, even you just being a platform for people to tell their stories, you're now a part of that story, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you for those kind words. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to stay in touch and we will. consider you a friend as for well. For sure. Um, yeah, you're saying about my story. I didn't think after like 10, 10 uh, videos in what, six weeks, I think, since I've been on here, something like that, two, two months. That's amazing. Weeks, that it'll be such, such a like crazy the roller rides, coaster yeah things you're in happened. it now man <laughs> yeah. yeah no escaping yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right all the best you take care you, you as well thanks rob cheers buddy cheers